Okay, welcome to the Wednesday, March 1st, 1st, 2023 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. As always, we begin our meetings with general public comment. Uh, is there anyone present who would like to speak on CPC related topics? If so, raise your hand, please. No? Okay, moving on, we have one quick approval of minutes going way back when. Uh, somehow it, it escaped our approval. Sarah sent them out, I believe, today. And the folks had a chance to look at it, but it's the minutes of, of uh, February 16th, 2022. So that goes back a while. Uh, even if you weren't on the committee, you can still vote to approve. Uh, so are there any comments about the minutes that folks would like to make, whether you were here or not? Can we get a motion to approve those minutes of 216.22? Move to approve. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any further comments on the minutes? Sarah, you have to take us through a roll call, right? We do. Uh, so we have two Jeffs now, Jeff Jones. Um, I'll abstain because I missed that meeting. All right. Uh, Chris? Uh, Jeff Dawson? I wasn't there, so I don't, can I vote or? I, you can still vote. You can, you can vote to endorse minutes even if you I'll, want. I'll endorse them then, thank you. Um, Jen? Yes. Jonah? Sure, yes. And Brian? Yes. Right. Not that I remember what happened last week. Yeah, at least we're... fell to the bottom of the pile somehow. I think they might have been kicked from a previous meeting and we just missed them. Um, speak. Uh, so we'll do a chair's report. And uh, just a few things to report. One is, uh, speaking of remembering things, I can't remember what happened last week, but I do remember what happened 50 years ago on this date, which was the release of Dark Side of the Moon, the Pink Floyd album that has nothing to do with anything, but also <laughs> in 1973 was the, not really a release, but the signing of the Endangered Species Act. Um, and I think one thing it's important for us to know as we get set, Sarah, if I'm correct on this, uh, to close on 229 more acres in the Sawmill Hills, which we approved in the last, um, in the fall round of CPC stuff. Uh, we now have somewhere around I think it's 27% of city land that is permanently protected land. A lot of that land hosts state endangered, I think some federally endangered species as well. So it's really nice to know that the CPC has done our part in really um, uh, recognizing the importance of conservation land and of species other than our own and setting aside so much, so much land uh, for that. Um, so that's uh, important, and so is welcoming Jeff Dawson. Jeff, uh, thank you for coming. Jeff is our sub or alternate from the Recreation Department for this round. As I think most of you know from the email, uh, Julia uh, is off on a Fulbright scholarship to Riga Siobhan, wherever that is. It's in like Latvia. Or yep. something. Riga, Latvia. If you ever Google stuff, Julie, it's really pretty impressive. I mean, she is, you know, a doctorate in physical therapy, a doctorate in philosophy, I think a master's in social work. She's gone to all these places. So that's really impressive. How dare she leave us for a few meetings to accept a Fulbright scholarship? I'm a little shocked that her priorities are so skewed, but um, that's that's the way that it goes. Uh, I think most of you also know that the um, CIF, the, the, the Community Investment Fund application was pulled. Uh, they were hoping for a good chunk of money from the ARPA, the uh, American Recovery Something Act, uh, and they did not. They did not get that. It was a very uh, 
uh, hotly contested uh, round to, to approve those funds. Uh, so they have withdrawn their application. Who knows whether they will get back to us. Um, Sarah sent out, and I don't know if she sent out to everyone, Sarah, but a number of projects have been moving forward. One we just mentioned, which is the 229 acres being closed in Sawmill Hills, which is the largest chunk ever, I think, of conservation land in one, uh, one fell swoop. So that's really exciting. Um, all of our projects for the fall were recommended and approved by city council. So they're all moving forward. Remember the Franklin Street Homeless Project of, I wanna say two years ago, Sarah, year and a half? Yeah, Something I think it's like fall 21. Is it? Well, uh, they have uh, moving towards opening, right? And that right. will be soon. So that's really exciting. Um, Lily Library Stairs is complete. The Canal Greenway uh, repairs are underway. The shepherd barn, as Sarah said, is moving along literally and figuratively. So uh, the um, the folks at Historic North Hampton do such a nice job in, in getting community involvement in all of their projects. So that's, that's really exciting. Uh, moving right along from the chair's report to the financial overview. Um, before, Sarah, Brian, before you do, can I just yeah. offer a quick field report um, addendum to that? Uh, on the Shepherd's Barn, um, if you've been following it in local media, they, as you indicated, they've been doing a lot of things to get the community involved. Part of it was moving the barn off its old foundation physically by hand with a couple hundred people pulling at it. And then the other was pulling it back. And I wasn't able to participate in that, but I did get to take part in a uh, timber framing workshop. Um, where the expert timber framers who are working on on the project um, uh, opened up their 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 workshop literally to a, a bunch of novices, so we could go in there and learn uh, <clears throat> the basics of uh, traditional timber framing techniques and do some framing. And then uh, last weekend, we actually did a uh, barn raising of the front front edition. There are two editions: one in the front, one in the back, and we did the the uh, structural barn raising on that last weekend uh, to a crowd. And I think Devin, you were there um, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, as was our other former colleague, Dave Drake. So, uh, um, you know, I can speak to the fact that uh, uh, the, 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 the money's getting spent, seems to be getting spent well, and it was a heck of a lot of fun. And I had an opportunity to learn quite a bit. And if you're at all interested, they're gonna be doing similar thing for, uh, the framing of the rear uh, edition, uh, the framing workshops are this weekend and the following weekend and the raising will be done based on weather and, and timing at some point in the future. But if you have any questions about that, you can either follow up with me or um, the people down at Historic Northampton. You don't have to have any skills, you just have to have patience and a willingness to lose a finger to a chisel if that's what it takes. So. Thank you, Thanks. Chris. Any other comments about ongoing projects that folks would like to make? Okay, Sarah, you want to take us through the uh, financial update? Sure. Uh, so I sent out the financial overview for the remainder of fiscal year 23. Um, this gives a summary of all of the, the revenues and expenditures to date. Our, our guess on how much we would be receiving from the state this year was pretty spot on. I think this is the best we've ever done. Um, there's only 21,000 uh, and change that, that can't be spent until next year that was received in excess of the funds that we were originally estimating, but that's great, that's good news. That means we received more from the state than we were anticipating. Um, and given all of the uh, set-asides and project expenditures from the beginning of the fiscal year. There's about 635,000 remaining um, for the fiscal year. And we have um, 429,000 in grants that were, grant applications that were submitted. Thank you, Sarah. Um, any questions for Sarah? about our fiscal stuff. Everybody good with that? 
So again, to reiterate what she said, uh, we have available for this round $635,000 and requests coming in total 429,000. Uh, any amount that we do not spend is carried over uh, to the next round, which should be the fall of this year. Uh, and I'll also add quickly just that the the three reserve accounts, so the the ten percent set asides that are mandated by the Department of Revenue, have been fully expended. So all of the funds remaining can be dedicated to any eligible project. Great. Any um, again, any questions for Sarah? Okay, so moving right along, the main task of this evening's meeting is to hear from the three applicants that we have, Historic Northampton Forbes Library and Smith uh, Charities. So we will go in that order that Sarah put up the agenda uh, at, uh, hearing from Historic Northampton first, followed by Forbes, and followed by Smith Charities. Uh, folks making the presentations, do know that uh, we have um, read your applications, that we had a chance to ask you questions, and Sarah uh, summarized those and got the answers back to us. And now we will hear from you. Also, please keep in mind that two weeks from tonight, on the 15th of March, the third Wednesday of the month, there's the chance for the public to weigh in on your projects. So uh, you can certainly encourage people, it will be by Zoom again to show up and have a chance to weigh in. Uh, it's a nice opportunity for us to hear from folks in town or in sometimes out of town, uh, their feelings for the project. So um, make sure that, that, that you rally your folks uh, if you are so inclined to get them to come two weeks from tonight at seven o'clock and Sarah puts the Zoom link up on the city, the city webpage there. Uh, so without further ado, we'll begin with the collections preservation request from, <coughs> excuse me, from Historic Northampton. Uh, and I know we got Elizabeth to speak to that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I was going to start with a very brief update on the Shepherd Barn project, but thanks to Chris, <laughs> I no longer have to. <laughs> You've given us all the wonderful specifics from a very personal point of view. It's moving along well. I saw Alicia Spence, the timber framer, this afternoon. She's done all the major uh, restoration work inside the barn. And I know you're starting this weekend to frame out the two rear additions. Well, it's actually one rear addition to the barn. She said the, the front one, the L's already done. And she expected that at the end of the month, there'll be another timber raising. So that, that should be really fun. Please come down for it. It's really something to see. Um, I, uh, Kelsey uh, Sinelnikoff is here. She's the collections manager. She's going to describe the project. And as part of her description, she'll show a few slides of two sleighs that we've had restored with one of the grants that you gave us um, for um, uh, restoration and conservation of artifacts for it. We did quite a number of, of the signs, the huge um, uh, shop signs from Main Street and, and the side streets um, from the 19th century. We've done those. And now we're working on um, two sleighs that are going to be hung uh, in the barn. And um, um, so that whole project is advancing. The project that Kelsey's going to talk about, the collections um, restoration project and preservation project, is really kind of a kind of midway through a long-term project that we've been undergoing, which is to assess and assess the preservation and do some remedial preservation of all our collections. The part that we're asking for tonight is really the big middle part, and that's the clothing, costume textile collections, as well as furniture. And those are the two big ones that we need outside expertise for. So I will get off here and let Kelsey describe the project. All right. 
Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm Kelsey Sonelnikoff. I'm the collections manager at Historic Northampton. Um, could I share my screen? Yep, should be all set. Okay. All right. So I just want to share a PowerPoint as I talk a little bit about um, the project. So like Betty said, um, so we're applying for CPA funding to conduct a preservation assessment of three of Historic Northampton's largest collection collections and um, probably some of our most historically significant ones are clothing, household, household textiles, and furniture collections. Um, it's estimated that the objects in these collections number around 7,000 objects the vast majority of which were made or used in Northampton um, and are important pieces in documenting Northampton's diverse history. And um, like Betty said, this is part of ongoing work to preserve and make accessible all the estimated 40,000 items in historic Northampton's collections. Um, these are some photos of some of the recent projects historic Northampton has undertaken in the last few years um, to better preserve track and provide access to our collections. And many of these are thanks to help from, CP, um, help from CPA funding, um, which we're grateful for. And um, I just put some images here of some, some to highlight. Um, these include our renovated storage and collections processing area. That project was done in 2017 and that's in the um, top right. Um, in 2021, we renovated our archive storage room. You can see it then and now it's right below it and um, inventoried the archives. And then just a few weeks ago, we installed new shelving, which you can see over here on the left um, in two rooms in the Parsons house on the second floor. And we are currently assessing collections in there and moving those collections into their new housing. Um, we've also done some smaller rehousing projects like the historic arms collections, um, Pro Brush, uh, EJ Gare, um, and like um, Betty mentioned the sleigh. And so um, we just got one of the sleighs back. You can see on the left here, the before photo, um, it basically didn't really have a seat anymore. Um, and then the after, it's really um, wonderful how we were really excited about how it looked and it really um, you know, brought it back to what it would have looked like. Um, Beyond those physical improvements, in recent years, we've done some projects that have set us up well for this upcoming assessment. Um, some other ones, including in the installation of new um, collections manage a new collections management database. Um, it's called Argus, and um, this provides better tracking of collections records, um, the locations of objects, and increases our ability to share. Um, the objects and their um, information with the public um, because it includes a public portal that's connected with our website where people can search our online our catalog. Um, and so this is just a couple images of that online public catalog. Um, and then a, this is an example record there. Um, and we've also done a number of sub collection inventories and assessments like the shep pieces from the Shepherd Barn, um, archives, audiovisual collections, and um, currently working, as I said, on that Parsons room. And this has given us some experience in how to plan for this larger preservation assessment and the resources, people, and time um, and supplies that we will need. So for the preservation assessment, um, we will be um, working on this project with the help of consultant museum collection specialists, project assistants, interns and volunteers and staff. Um, with, the, um, with that team, we plan to examine and document each of the objects in these collections. Um, so we'll look at them each individually, assessing and recording things like condition, location, provenance, uh, measurements, dates. As we examine the objects, we will take steps um, to address conservation concerns and improve collections uh, housing. Um, so that would mean things like um, cleaning, so removing dust and dirt, um, improving individual housing. There's an image here with dresses hanging and you can see a wire hanger. So it'd be like adding padding, making sure those are properly supported. Um, below that, you'll see some boxes um, that are acidic. So it'd be rehousing things like that into archival boxes. Again, improving um, some of the housing that way. 
And, um, and we'll also note other hazards that we might come across. Um, so that would be things like um, pest infestations or mold. So like isolating those materials, consulting with conservationists as needed as we go through them. Um, we will also update records and images, create digital records. Um, a great byproduct of this um, project will be uh, digital records of the collection, which will enable us to know exactly what we have, where it is, and share that with the public. Uh, this is important for a number of reasons, from public access and interpretation um, to planning, um, to an interpretation planning, to security and disaster planning, and even just kind of minimizing wear and tear so we're not, uh, we know exactly where things are and can access them easily. Um, finally, the consultants will create overall uh, collections reports um, and plans recommending long-term preservation plans, um, doing curatorial assessment with things like assessing the strengths or the gaps in the collections to help for future uh, planning. The collections that we're going to be assessing um, include the clothing and accessories collection, which we estimate to be about 5,000 objects. It includes many different clothing items, um, shoes, hats, dresses, shirts, pants, outerwear, um, all sorts of accessories dating primarily from the 18th century um, to the 21st century, pretty much up to the present. And this collection is probably our most well-known um, and recognized throughout New England and beyond. Researchers travel to uh, Historic Northampton to see the collection. Pieces have been featured in publications and in many exhibitions in the region and further out. Um, it's particularly strong in late 19th century women's dresses. Um, that was a period when we had a thriving dressmaking industry that employed as many as 100 women and girls. And um, we have some great documentation on those um, dresses. Um, and the collection in general, though, also just has a really great breadth and um, paper documentation. Um, many different pieces of clothing connected with different people, groups, um, families who have called Northampton home throughout its history. And on the next slide, I just want to highlight a couple examples to give you an idea. Um, we have a bodice here from silk grown and spun in Northampton and connected with the beginnings of the silk industry in Florence. Uh, we have stockings made by McCallum's, another industry and business. Uh, we have pieces in the collection related to Northampton State Hospital, like these patients' shoes. And um, we have more recent um, examples like this pride t-shirt. Um, uh, so how they go, um, as I said, the collection will come right up to the 21st century. And uh, the next collection we'll be looking at is are the um, household textiles. Uh, we estimate that that collection is about a thousand objects, primarily 18th to 20th century, and includes things like quilts, blankets, sheets, tablecloths, napkins, window coverings, um, all sorts of different household um, textiles. Like the clothing collection, the items in this collection were primarily locally made and have strong Northampton connections. Uh, many of the quilts have been featured in publications, and the collections also include um, things like a number of um, locally woven 18th century household textiles and napkins. Um, so again, some great pieces um, assisting us with looking at both the clothing and these household textiles, um, we plan to bring on uh, Lynn Bassett um, as a curatorial consultant. Um, Lynn has 40 years of experience working with costumes and textiles. She's a cost costume and textiles historian. Um, she's worked with many groups um, and studied pieces um, throughout New England, um, but a lot in the Connecticut Ra River Valley, um, including as curator at Historic Northampton in the early 1990s. Um, she's got a great depth of knowledge of this collection. Um, she's worked with it a number of times since she was curator and um, a great depth of knowledge on clothing and textiles in general. Um, that will be invaluable for the project. Um, she will work with the project assistant, um, really train them, really working to look at each of the pieces. And um, yeah, well, her 
her knowledge will be wonderful for it and really help us to move efficiently um, through the project. Um, finally, the third collection is our furniture and furnishings collection, which we estimate to be about a thousand objects. It includes things like chairs, tables, desks, bookcases, stools, uh, lighting devices, clocks, chests. They date primarily 18th century through the 20th century. Uh, like the other collections, many of the furnishings were made in Northampton and are used by local um, families, people, businesses. It is particularly strong in late 18th, early 19th century chairs made in Northampton. That's one highlight. Um, this was a period um, when Northampton, as a growing commercial center in the valley, um, had a large number of furniture and cabinet makers, especially um, relative to its size. And we have some wonderful pieces um, from that period as examples. Um, some other highlights include um, a Florence sewing machine, locally made clocks, um, furniture from Northampton State Hospital, among many others. For um, this assessment, um, we plan to bring on museum specialist Richard Malley. Um, he has several decades of experience working with furniture collections in New England museums. And um, he'll work with the project assistant um, to again carefully document and evaluate each object. And I think his expertise as well um, will really be invaluable to the project and very helpful um, in helping us both meet our goals and move moving efficiently through it. So outcomes for the project. Um, this project will result in better intellectual control, public access, and security. Um, specifically, the project will improve collections preservation and documentation. Documentation and rehousing is essential to preserving the collections. Uh, we will be able to identify conservation concerns, make sure knowledge of the objects is not lost. That's preserved for future use. We're recording this important history and the important care information for going forward. Um, and uh, we'll be doing that individual object rehousing as well um, to help with its long-term preservation. Um, the project will also increase collection security and disaster planning. Uh, a current list of what we have and where it is is essential to good collections care and long-term preservation. Uh, the project will also improve public access, um, update, updated records and images um, in an accurate and searchable database that is accessible to the public will be one way to improve that access. Um, the project will also, um, with the current location reporting, allow objects to be easily physically accessed for use by researchers and in programs and exhibits and other interpretation projects. Uh, finally, um, it will facilitate long-term collections care, planning, and interpretation. Again, assessing everything in the collection will allow us to better understand what we have and how to care for it. This information serves as a foundation for exhibits, programs, and research, and it allows us to make sure we are serving the community and caring for its history to the highest standards. Um, to reach these goals, it is essential that we bring on the people with the expertise, skills, and time to work with the thousands of objects in these collections. With funding, we'll be able to hire the consultants with the collections knowledge required and a project assistant who will allow us to efficiently move through the project. We will also use the funding to consult with conservators as issues with objects are identified and carry out recommended steps for stabilization. And finally, we need supplies to make those basic improvements to the collections housing and support. Um, so in conclusion, thank you um, for your consideration and time. And um, myself and Betty are happy to answer um, any questions or provide any more details. So, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Kelsey and Betty. Uh, questions from committee members? Anybody? Uh, I'll ask a couple quick ones then. The first is my understanding is that the goal of this project is assessment and not preservation. Is that correct? So you're going to be assessing all the items in these three major collections, but actually not doing needed preservation work. Is that, am I right within that? Um, we will be doing some preservation work with it as well. 
So like I said, we'll be doing things like um, improving kind of individual objects, housing. So like adding support and padding. So like in a couple of images, it showed some boxes, like there's some objects that I know we will, well, I know we have that we need archival to be in archival boxes. And so we'll be doing some of that basic care um, to improve their housing. Um, so that'll be one way it's um, improving their preservation. And then as we come across hazards, we'll consult with conservators and do things like if we came across mold, we would isolate objects, address that mold issue, um, do things like, um, or isolate if there was like, see pest infestations. Um, so yeah, there will be a preservation aspect too, or we're physically working on the preservation. Yeah, in a, in effect, assessment is preservation. You know, if you <laughs> you have to go through everything and look at it individually to 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 learn those things, and you know, take the remedial steps as they come, and then plan for the bigger steps. But you really can't do it unless you really go through your whole collection. And do you anticipate coming back? for further funding with some of those bigger steps, those bigger preservation steps? I could imagine in the future. I don't think we have um, a plan right now. I mean, one of the, the purposes of doing this is to assess the whole collection so we have a plan, so we can make a plan. I mean, if you want me to dream, I, I would really like to have new collections, better collection storage for some of that, especially the costume collection. You know, right now it's on the second floor of an old house, and um, which is good. We're doing the best we can, but you know, um, a bigger, a better one. Another, you know, in five or ten years, okay, maybe we'd come back to you. But I don't have that plan in mind right now. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Uh, I can add that at. Uh, the Historical Commission meeting um, just Monday evening, they enthusiastically agreed to support the uh, the project uh, and also determined that the collections specifically are important to the history of Northampton. Um, so because the collections themselves are not listed on the National Register of Historic Places, that's the um, eligibility trip for this. So the Historical Commission agreed that that was certainly met and also that the collections are world-class and need to be preserved. I know that one of the considerations is um, public access, public involvement, and um, we try to do that as much as we can. The new computer system, computer, um, well, the collections management system that Kelsey talked about, Argus, has that feature where you can really look at the collection. You can create your own folder. You can save things into your folder. You can compare things. It's a much more advanced system than we ever had in the past. And most museums are going toward that. And one of the reasons is so that, first of all, it can be more widely understood. You know, you don't have to, um, you can be anywhere and look at it. But also it saves on wear and tear, you know? I mean, that's the preservation key is so everyone's not pawing through everything. You can look up exactly what you want, you know where it is, you access it and um, you work with it. And that's that preserves it better than looking through it. Thank you. Any question? Any further questions from committee members? Okay, so uh, Kelsey and Betty, again, to reiterate, two weeks from now, we will be hearing from public about the project. So if you have folks who want to speak to that, please invite them to that seven o'clock meeting. Uh, and good luck with the Shepherd Barn stuff uh, and hope that it all gets framed up. Um, there are no further questions for Kelsey and Betty. We will move on to Forbes Library, and I believe Lisa is here to guide us through that. So thank you, Kelsey and Betty. You're welcome to stick around, but uh, otherwise, we will you will be hearing from us. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Lisa, we're not hearing you.
still not hearing you. Hello? There we go. Yay. Oh, so sorry Yay. about that. No. I'm Lisa Downing of the library direct, Forbes Library Director. And I have with me tonight uh, Pat McCarthy, who's the head of the City Central Services, as who is our partner on this project, and Devin Bruce, who is a trustee of Forbes Library. I have in my office off, off camera is our facilities manager, Jason Petson, but he's here in case there's questions that I can't answer. So I'm here tonight to briefly present our application called Bathroom Mechanical Systems Improvements under the preservation category. Uh, we are requesting $66,500 towards a total project budget of $110,550. Forbes Library had 220,000 visitors in 2019, the last year before the impact of the pandemic. Library attendance has been slowly edging back and we anticipate hitting that number again within the next couple of years. This results in lots of people needing to use the bathroom while visiting our historic building. We have seven single stall all gender bathrooms spread over four floors. Six of the seven were built during the last major renovation that ended about 1998 and the other bathroom was renovated about that same time. We have been aware of the need to improve the accessibility and functionality of these bathrooms for as long as I have worked at the library, which is coming up on two decades, and have made it an active priority for the last several years. Stavros, um, who uh, did an accessibility audit of our building about 10 years ago after we added the accessibility elevator in our front entrance, and we received high, rem high remarks for all areas of our building uh, we've worked very hard to make this building fully accessible, which is a challenge with a Victorian building, except for our bathrooms. They are extremely challenging for people in wheelchairs, with walkers, and with limited strength or mobility because of the weight of the doors, a threshold lip, and the limited access to pull the door open from the inside. To address this, we applied and received for a CDBG grant of $44,050 to address these concerns. We also learned that our bathrooms never met code for ventilation. The lack of fresh air, they lack fresh air exchange. This results in bathrooms that are high, very high humid, humidity, high levels of CO2, and that often, frankly, smell very bad. This happened well before my time and before Jason Pets and our facilities manager was in the role that he currently has. So we don't know exactly why it wasn't addressed at the time of the renovation. Our guess is that it was value engineered under the assumption that the door opening and closing would provide enough air exchange. The library also had significantly less foot traffic than it does today. And perhaps the high usage of the bathrooms was not anticipated. One quick note about that is that our bathrooms are listed on a public resource card that is given out to houseless folks and others in need of resources. We intentionally want, want and invite people from the, from the streets and anyone in our community who's downtown and needs access to a bathroom to come and, act, make, and use our bathrooms. So this means that the bathrooms are an even higher demand per foot traffic than you might imagine. The city hired Towsley Associates Consulting Engineers to design a solution. Because of the height and historic nature of our building, this is very complicated. Mr. Towsley has found a solution that will bring our bathroom ventilation system into compliance with code that involves adding vents to each of the bathrooms and duct work that will go up and out the roof. I will now ask Pat McCarthy to talk further about the proposal from Towsley Associates. Sorry about that trying to unmute it in the wrong place. <laughs> so um, I'm Pat McCarthy, Central Services Director. Um, uh, yes, uh, we hired uh, Bill Towsley, a uh, mechanical engineer to find a solution. And um, I know he put it in writing, but basically that um, the existing um, bathrooms do not meet code as far as uh, ventilation to ASHRAE standards in the Massachusetts State Code. 
And uh, he is proposing, my understanding is that he is proposing that there is actually no supply uh, from an HVA system into those bathrooms. There are exhausts, but no supply, which essentially is like holding the top of a straw when you have liquid in it, that it'll never uh, drop the liquid unless you take your finger off. So that's my understanding of it anyway. So basically with the introduction of uh, air from the uh, HVA system that is already that already exists uh, close to the bathrooms, uh, it'll allow the ventilation to work. Like right now, uh, essentially uh, like a straw holding your finger over it um, is, is holding the air uh, from being circulated out of the building. Um, does anyone have any specific? I can answer as best I can. Any questions? Before we go there, Pat, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Devin Bruce, one of our trustees, is here to talk a little bit about the project as well. And then we'll be happy to take any and all questions. Hi, all. Um, I'm going to do a quick wrap up. And, but first, I want to say that we, uh, Lisa and Pat and I talked about putting together a presentation. And basically what you would see would be the pictures that are in the proposal that you have, because everything else is done inside the wall of the library. So we don't want you to think we weren't prepared for tonight's work with you, but we really felt like it was better to talk to you directly about what we were up to. So uh, I'm, I'm summarizing just a couple of points. Um, the proposal you have before you focus very carefully on making sure that the project qualified for CPA funding and it spoke directly to the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation and looked at the uh, mechanical systems that particularly call out that uh, piping and ductwork can be done uh, as part of that work. Uh, Sarah uh, brought us around to some questions that I think made us look at the code and the the thing to get across is that the building wasn't done to code when it was done before so certainly you have historic buildings throughout the city that may not be current to code right now but they met code for when they were worked on last this isn't one of those it didn't meet code when it was done in 1998 and the effect of the pandemic and the concern for ventilation has even emphasized how important that is to us now. Um, I'd like to sort of grin and say, um, I, I know you expect to see lots of letters of support from people in the community, but you know it's not great for people in the community to talk about their bathroom experience. So we were very creative to look at how do we tell you what we know and we went back through a, a, a search through a questionnaire that we'd been running for another purpose and were able to find um, unsolicited comments about the problems with our bathrooms. And, and we kind of grinned when we put that in the proposal because it sort of, uh, in, in an unusual way for you, digs into the kind of problems we deal with day to day. Um, Lisa hinted at the expanded role of the library and what these bathrooms and services, there are people spending a lot of time in the library. It's a warming station. It's a, it's a, a, a facility that is being used above and beyond what it had in the past. And uh, I'd just like to say as a new trustee, I'm astounded how much Lisa does with that library. So um, it's, it's a, uh, it's doing a lot of things, let's just put it that way. Um, and the last point I wanna make is that ventilation systems were dull and not much thought about four or five years ago, and that's not the case now. Um, you know, I think about whether River Valley Market is, is doing its ventilation system in their redesign. And I think this is one of those cases where the events of the pandemic are calling us to revisit situations in that old historic building. Um, and last, I, I know everyone who speaks to you sort of by graciousness ends by saying thank you for your time, but I know how much time you put in to be on this committee, 
And, um, and I know how good Brian is at chairing the committee. Thank you, Brian, for still being there. And uh, I'd also like to say it was one of the best jobs I ever had in town. It's a great committee to serve on. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Devin. Devin. Devin and Lisa and Patrick. Uh, questions from committee members for the three of them? Uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah has reached out to um, Stuart. I can't remember his last name at the at the uh, the community. Sagmore. Thank you, Sagmore, the Community Preservation Coalition, because uh, the, the the question still is, in my mind, uh, is is this uh, historic preservation? Uh, we don't doubt. I think any of us doubt for a moment the necessity of having adequate bathroom ventilation, but doesn't meet the historic preservation requirements as set forth. Uh, Sarah, did Stuart get back to us? He did not. Um, I received an out of the office reply when I reached out to him last week. So I, I may hear back from him this week. I don't know. But I, I think what Devin mentioned is an important distinction that wasn't really clear in the application that this work was always a code issue. You know, there, there are constantly changing issues in building codes, you know, our values and in insulation, you know, windows, walls, all sorts of things that are, that may be different even from when you put up a building to the next year. But if this wasn't compliant when it was installed, that might be a, a distinction that would allow it to be funded through the CPA. So my understanding from a conversation with you, Sarah, is that uh, it would certainly not meet code if it was installed today. Correct. But but if we're going back in time. But if it, yeah, if it never met code and should have been addressed at that time and is correcting an error that's always existed, then that may be a really important distinction as far as funding eligibility. So we're going back to the uh, 1998 uh, renovation work. Is that correct? I've seen Devin nod her head. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that was that's... the last time it was worked on, Brian. And I guess my example of, you know, buildings vary in their code requirements depending on when they were last worked on and were they done to code then. And the reason Pat is here with us tonight is to say, you know, we've checked with with engineers and it it wasn't done to code when it was done in 1998. It needs an air exchange system that both brings in air and takes out air, and it only has half of that. Uh, Patrick, any thing you would like to add to this? Uh, no, I think Devin hit all the notes in Lisa. Do you have any specific questions I can try to answer? Uh, committee members, questions? I have a quick question. Is is the only work being done right now the ventilation or are you doing other work? Like you were talking about the doors and just general accessibility. And I this is just also getting at that eligibility question because you had, Sarah, you had mentioned like if there is other work that requires bringing it up to code that could also potentially help it qualify. So just curious if there's other work being done sort of alongside this work. Yeah, so the, there is, uh, that that work is adding uh, push buttons to the doors and uh, taking out that, uh, that lip. Uh, so there is work being done. It does, I know it will be um, cutting into the walls for the electricity of that project, but I'm not sure, I guess Sarah did talk to me a little bit about that too. Um, that work hasn't begun yet. Pat's office is overseeing that project as well. And um, we're going out to bid Pat for that project soon, I think, right? Well, and, and I would add in a way, Lisa, you use the acronym for how that work is being funded, but in a way you can think of the library is going out and seeking matching funds to handle some of the corrections to the accessibility issues with the bathroom. 
So they aren't they aren't ventilation work, but honestly, the doors are part of the problem that causes the bathroom to behave the way it does. So um, you, Lisa, help me with the acronym: Community Development Block, block Grant Group. Money. Block yes. Grant Money. So so some effort has already been underway to try to fix part of this problem for accessibility, and this is the piece about the internal air quality. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you both. Other questions? Sarah, can you continue to reach out to Stuart and see what the what the what the coalition? Because I I know um, Lisa, I believe in the in the follow up questions you sent a number of different. Uh, examples of CPC funding for different towns in terms of ventilation, but I don't think any of them were specific to simply bathroom ventilation. I don't know if that means it's a different category or not. I mean, our concern, of course, is that we do what is what is legal and, and we don't touch it if it's not, so you can understand that. And we just want to make sure that we're not in violation of the of the pretty strict guidelines that are out there. I mean, it seems to me that uh, something that Stuart could could know, or our city solicitor, if it goes to that, is that uh, again the work that was done in 1998. If in fact the bathrooms were in violation of the code, then then uh, if that was not corrected, then by default they sort of become a violation of code now. I mean, that's a that would be my understanding of it. So we'll have so Sarah, we're going to ask that you further figure that one out. That would be nice. Uh, Devin? Um, Sarah, you should know that I called the coalition and that Lisa ran the database query. Um, we were cautioned that that list of projects uh, historically can somewhat be a little expansive depending on that that what one town decides would have been a project may not be guidance for what another town. Yeah, absolutely. there's definitely some not in any way allowable projects. Right. So, um, I just but, but, but you know, but, it is it is good to know what other communities have yeah, done. And I, then I language sort of, especially is a little bit nebulous about you know what code compliance is. Yeah. I'm just indicating we put in our footwork to try to answer that question for you. And I want to say that it it comes with that caveat. But the thing that I felt really good about was the reference and the background of having gone through the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation and those citations are in your in your package. So the only piece that Sarah has led us to, and I appreciate it, is to speak to the code issue that it it wasn't done right the first time. And that's really what we're fixing. Other questions for Devin, Lisa, or Patrick? Uh, there were a lot of this, a lot of money, um, bids, did three bids go out for this? Patrick, you're nodding your head. Is that right? No, we have not bid it yet. You have not bid at all. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon? So no, we received the mechanical engineer's cost estimate and we have not bid it yet. Um, my, um, uh, recommendation would be, uh, to dovetail the two projects, the ventilation and the handicap accessibility at the same time to streamline. And also, um, you know, we may be able to, um, you know, cut a hole once rather than twice in the wall. So there is gonna be some penetration of the wall for the wiring for the, the door openers. Um, and we'll be doing the same with the ventilation running ductwork. So, it would be good if those two were dovetailed and done at the same time, bid separately, but done at the same time by the same contractor. Yeah. Um, are there any other ventilation problems in the library other than um, the bathrooms that you folks are talking about? You do have um, some rare collections there in the library. Um, and I'm really curious about how this 
happened in 1998. It sounds like that would be a great um, story for an aggressive journalist to try and unearth how that happened. Yeah, so I can I can speak to the ventilation issues in general at the library. So it, as as Devin alluded to, we we thought that's pretty much all we thought about is is air quality and air exchange there for for quite a while during the heart of the pandemic, and we have we are monitoring spaces for CO two and um, and have identified spaces that have more or less fresh air intake and have added air purifiers, sort of lo local a localized solution. Um, we are also working with Pat's office to improve the ventilation on the ground floor. That's a separate project that we're not talking about this evening, but I know that will greatly enhance ventilation in the basement because there are unconditioned, as they call it, areas of the basement that don't have good air exchange at all. Um, the special collections have their own HVAC system and are monitored for humidity, uh, temperature, and we've also been doing the CO2 and, and they're, they're in very good shape. Luckily. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? So uh, Pat and Devin and Lisa, thank you for joining us. And again, reminder two weeks from tonight, folks want to speak passionately about their bathroom experiences at Forbes. Now, I'll, have to give, I'll have to give some thought about how to recruiting people, Brian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or not. Uh, thank so you thank so you, much. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome to stick around. But otherwise, thank we'll you. Move on to our third and last presentation, which is the uh, continuation of the uh, exterior historic repairs at the Smith Charities Building. Uh, and I believe Carol is going to speak to that. Is that right, Carol? So yes. thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm gonna try sharing screen here. Okay. Um, okay, can you see, can you see it? Okay, great. Um, nice to meet you all. Um, my name's Carol Gray and I'm a trustee at Smith Charities. And um, for many of you, you've seen this before, but some of you are new. So I'm just gonna start from scratch here. Uh, so this is our application and you see from the title, this is phase two. Um, there will be another phase. Uh, the, the project is for um, an architecture, of an architecturally historic important building on, at 51 Main Street. You've walked by, past it many times. Uh, and it is for the exterior, the restoration work of the exterior. And um, just to tell you a little bit more about what Smith Charities is. So um, you might have heard of a person named Oliver Smith. Uh, he was, uh, he died in uh, 1845 and left a very unusual will, uh, which uh, he, he had saved up all his money over the years. And uh, some say he was a miser, but in any event, he, he wanted to leave it to good causes. So he designed categories of people that he thought were needy in the community. Um, his mother was actually a widow herself, so he knew firsthand about poverty of widows. And so he designed grants uh, to go to different categories of people. Here are a couple of categories, widows with children under age 18, tradespeople, um, nurses are also part of uh, tradespeople. Um, and so the will, uh, he, he set aside money in the beginning and set aside a framework for how to have this be a self-sustaining um, uh, gift uh, beneficiary framework, which was that uh, the organization has m mortgages. So they they buy, they have mortgages, they're kind of like a bank, uh, and uh, and they have a certain amount of money that they can lend. Uh, and, uh, and then the income is based on whatever the interest rates are. So when interest rates were low, there was not as much income. Uh, so uh, 
in any event, so that's what Smith Charities does is, uh, and the other thing that they do, part of their charitable mission is uh, that they give to the Smith Vocational School, uh, a certain, the, the will had, and the probate court had set up that a certain percentage of one of the funds is to always go to Smith Folk. So, uh, so that's what the framework is. It is a 501c3, it's a nonprofit. It's a very small organization. There's one staff member. I'm not a staff member. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and there there are representatives from from uh, various towns. Oliver Smith himself lived in Hatfield, but the building is uh, in Northampton. And here it is, uh, 51 Main Street. And it's really it's really a unique building. It's uh, um, built in in 1865. Uh, this is the write up from. Um, from Historic Northampton's website. Uh, it was uh, built in the Victorian Renaissance style uh, and it was designed by a local architect. Uh, it typifies Victorian version of the Renaissance revival. Um, the building was constructed with ashlar masonry, displays double light Venetian windows um, and crisp cut detailed uh, coinings, coining, I'm gonna show, show you more what that is at the corners. Uh, the monumental aspect of the Smith Charities building harmonizes with its purpose. Oliver Smith of Hatfield died in 1845, leaving a remarkable will whereby indigent children and women were to receive financial assistance. assistance. The will actually has a fascinating story. It was contested by his heirs. And there was this infamous trial where uh, Daniel Webster was the attorney who defended the will and uh, and he won. And so the will stood and um, and the and people have benefited from it uh, since that time. Um, over nine million has been given in gifts to people who really, really need it. Um, so that's that's the framework. Um, here's an old picture uh, of what it looked like in the earlier days. Uh, hasn't changed much. What what's around it has changed quite a bit. Um, and. Everything that we're bringing to you today uh, is part of the historic preservation plan that was in the final report by Jones Wissett Architects. And this study was funded uh, through a grant from the Mass Historic Association in uh, 2018. And so uh, we've completed phase one. Uh, we're on phase two. Uh, we hope there will only be a phase three, but that depends in part on how much we accomplish in, in phase two. And uh, phase three, I'm told, will be not as expensive as the first two phases, hopefully. Um, uh, the masonry work in the first phase and we uh, anticipate in the second phase as well uh, was completed by Structures North. Uh, as you can see from this uh, bio or the resume of the Structures North people, they worked on the Massachusetts State House, Harvard Divinity School. So they're they're really uh, pros. And, and the combination of Jones was set architects who are doing the engineering and the architectural design and Structures North, it's really a great combination. Uh, Structures North would have to bid as they did in the past because uh, you, it, there's a bidding process that's required for the uh, mass historic grant that we're applying for. Uh, and we, we hope and anticipate they will be the winning bid as they were in the past. Um, here is, is the budget. Um, so I'll also point out and give a great thanks that uh, you did fund the, the highest priority things in the last uh, round. Um, and here are the things that were not funded. Um, attic wall repairs, attic collar ties, uh, Perlin sister, rafter sister. I'll explain what some of these are, a cone replacement. Uh, so all of that, and then the engineering and design fee is 10% of the overall. Uh, so that comes to uh, 234,617 and 50 cents is what we're seeking. Um, and uh, here's a little description of what Jones was at Architect talked about. Uh, this is restoration work. And if you think about how the building itself was built in 1865, once we get this facade done, you know, the last one lasted a century and a half. So uh, Jones was at architect said it will last decades. I'm optimistic it might last, last at least a century because the materials are even better quality than what they had available in the 1800s. Uh, so, and it would uh, preserve the exterior masonry on the south elevation and retie the roof framing to the exterior walls. Uh, once complete, the significant masonry restoration to the roof and facade should not be needed for several decades. So long after we're dead, will anything be needed on the exterior once this is done? 
Um, we do have an application that will be filed for um, $100,000 to the Massachusetts Historic Commission. Um, and by the way, thank you very much for uh, your support letter. We, we really appreciate that uh, to, um, for people who might be new. Uh, the, the local Historic Commission uh, provides a support letter to allow us to apply for that grant. So we really appreciate that. Um, in the past, uh, Mass Historic has given grants that typically are in the fifty thousand dollar range. So we're even though we're asking for a hundred thousand, we don't anticipate that they're going to meet that. Um, so uh, um, other grants. Um, so we did look into other grant possibilities. Uh, some uh, that had deadlines last fall, but um, we uh, the Jones was said architects report is voluminous and uh, I, you do have that. I provided that with the application, but what, what you'll see is that there are so many things on it. It's not just the exterior work, there's interior work, some of which we've been tackling in little, you know, smaller portions that, that fit with our budget, um, but, uh, but we just don't have any kind of budget to handle this exterior work that is so costly. Uh, but uh, but this grant um, for mass historic preservation um, for ten thousand dollars, there are some things that um, like we need to have the doors refinished and uh, uh, and so that's a but that's only up to ten thousand. As you can see, the cost of the Jones Wissett Architect provided they're they're in the hundreds of thousands. Um, I did look into um, Sarah gave me the names of a couple of grants and I looked into Mass Cultural Council grants, but they require you to uh, uh, have a project that benefits tourism. And so I don't, ours doesn't really fit that well. Um, I was curious about whether we could try to access more funding you know, for down the road for additional restoration work through uh, if we were to become a national historic landmark. Um, I think Sarah wasn't that optimistic that that would open up much, but uh, but anyway, I, I looked and uh, uh, it would be a process to try to get us declared a national historic landmark. And I don't know if we're enough national that, that we could do that, but but in any event, so th th that's uh, some of what we've looked into and the we're hopeful, we did get the Mass Historic Commission grant last year, or not last year, but last funding, funding last the first phase, which was a couple of years ago. So we hope that they'll wanna continue with the project and see that it's worthy as it was before. Um, so here's some of the architectural drawings by Jones Wissett Architects. Uh, you can see the outside facade is some of the work that uh, is being done. Um, there's also roofing work, flashing, and uh, rebuilding of the chimney is one of the, the big things, restoration of the chimney. Um, and uh, here are some other drawings that just show it from different angles. Uh, deep, deeply shaley brownstone units must be replaced, uh, splitting stone units. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of some of that. Um, uh, so here's, um, here's, just examples of, of the outside and the, the keystones, uh, replacement of keystones. Uh, and here's a picture of the roof. It's a little bit at a funny angle, but anyway, you can see the chimney that needs uh, restoration. Um, and um, and uh, there's also masonry work and carpentry work in the attic. And uh, that is work that we, are going to try to get done, if, if funded, uh, try to get that done before the stone masonry work happens because uh, it's, uh, Joan Wissett Architects said that it's better if we could you know, get that done and then the masons come in hopefully this summer. Uh, and uh, if we do get the Mass Historic Grant, uh, the whole thing would need to be uh, completed um, by, uh, by June 30th, 2024, but but we anticipate we, we might be able to get it done by this fall. Um, but anyway, so uh, we're hoping to see if we can get carpenters to do the attic work uh, and maybe maybe save a little bit of money because uh, the stone masons would probably be subbing that out anyway. Um, so uh, so um, that's what we're working on now. Um, here's other pictures. So what is going to be happening in, in the attic? Well, um, part of what we're looking at is on this on the right side, you see that the Jones Wissett Architects drawing says that the top of the east wall bows out. Well, the um, as I understand it, the walls kind of start to 
pull apart because of the heaviness of the stone. And so if you put in things called collar ties, they can, um, here's an example. The, this, this isn't by Jones Wissett Architect. I just found it online, but collar ties basically pull a structure together, kind of like a tree that's forking and you put in that cable to keep it, you know, from bowing. Um, so uh, so this is this is the inside of the attic. So you can see it was a well-built building. You know, this was built to stand for centuries and, and it has, uh, but uh, it, putting in more collar ties um, and uh, that, that will just, uh, I, I'm told those are actually pretty critical. Um, and so those were things that, that weren't in the first round, weren't fun in the first round. Um, uh, and so I just wanted to um, thank you for phase one support. Um, so here's some of what got, got accomplished. You can see this is, this is not a small task. Uh, so uh, they bring in these cranes, they built this, all this scaffolding and but look what they did, you know, the, the picture on the left, this cornice has been all refurbished. And on the right, you can see that they redid the stonework here. So it's beautiful and it'll last, I think, centuries, uh, but it's not cheap. Uh, anyway, so thank you. Um, and uh, that's, that's the overview and we really appreciate your support. Thank you, Carol. Uh, questions for Carol? Um, has there, Carol, there's there's one staff person, one right. full-time staff person, correct? Yes. And the, pub, the public does not come into the building much, is that correct? Well, the public can always, it's always open. Anyone can come in, um, but they, uh, and, because we have mortgages for the public, there are, and it's, they're old fashioned. So some people literally come in like a bank and they pay their mortgage in there. Um, I, I've been thinking down the road, it would really be nice if it could be, um, I, was, I was trying to think, how could this be more of a public building? Um, and I, uh, I don't know, I've always liked the art walks uh, in, in various towns. And I thought, I wonder if we could like, you know, put art on the walls and like open it up. And because the inside is actually quite beautiful. It's got some beautiful woodwork and it's got this ancient safe because it was built like a bank. So it's got this huge vault uh, in the middle. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's also a second floor that down the road, you know, if we could get that restored, I thought, I thought this could be really, great for the community there's a room that uh that maybe could become you know uh maybe could a non another nonprofit could use it or it could be a community room but at this point that restoration work hasn't happened for the second floor so the public's always welcome you can go and look anytime you can knock on the door and walk in but we're not really you know we sell we sell mortgages <laughs> sell mortgages and we give away grants so it's it's not um you know, we're not really a gallery, but uh, but yeah, the public's always welcome to come in anytime, but they they don't typically. Don't know. I, I will I will say though, you know, in terms of like the why there's a public interest in it, it is part of the Northampton Historic District, and I think it may be the only uh, historic building in that district, maybe even in the town that has had the same function from when it was built in the 1800s until now. So I, I think from a from a historic Northampton perspective, you know, it's it's part of the viewscape. Like you don't go through the downtown without seeing this beautiful building. And anyway, but okay, I'm happy to have questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Carol. Could you, could you speak more about the kinds of capital improvements you guys have undertaken out of your own revenue streams on the interior, you mentioned sort of smaller budget things. I sure. ask you that because it was one of our hesitations this fall. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know that. And I, I appreciate that. And I, and I don't want people to think that we're not, you know, we do, it's a lovely building and none of us wants it to fall into disrepair. Um, but the stonework is just, you know, it deteriorated over a century and a half. But yeah, so some of the things that we have taken care of ourselves in the past couple of years, um, 
Oh, things like plumbing and a new toilet, uh, uh, power flush toilet installation and outside faucet, an alarm uh, system, including a panic button. We only have one person there, so it's important for security. Uh, heating boiler, um, uh, air conditioning repair, new air conditioning required um, electrician to install the air conditioning. Um, all of these things totaled $15,578, and that was just uh, since 2019. So it's an old building, so things, uh, things break and things need to be repaired and, you know, boilers aren't cheap and alarm systems aren't cheap. And, uh, and there's also the restoration work down the road inside. I, this part, part of why we're coming to uh, the CPC for the exterior is because the exterior is seen by everybody in the, in the downtown. So it's, it's, uh, you know, I think it's in the whole community's interest to preserve beautiful buildings that that are, you know, really part of the the character of the whole downtown. Um, but anyway, but yeah, so I mean, fifteen thousand over the past few years. Um, it's, uh, you know, for charity, that's, we're, we're, and we still want to keep investing in the building. And, uh, and like I said, the, the outside doors need to be refinished. That's probably going to be thousands. We're in the process of getting quotes. And if we can get a matching fund through uh, the, uh, the Mass Historic 10,000 grant, that's small enough that it could, you know, cover a project like that. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I and I don't know if if these other avenues of like becoming a uh, if we could become a um, a national historic landmark if that could open up other avenues of funding I, I'm not sure, but um, maybe with interest rates going up too that will help because <laughs> our income stream depends on interest rates for mortgages. Um, but um, anyway, uh, yeah, we um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Other questions from committee members? Uh, I'll ask one more if I may. And I, sure. I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. And I don't mean to be disrespectful in asking it. But with a staff of one with limited public access or people not coming into the building, have thoughts been given to selling the building and relocating Smith Charities to a something that doesn't require any maintenance. Uh, I mean, it's an old building, it's always gonna require one. Yeah, you know, I there was actually um, a letter in the application. I, at least I attached it last fall, but and I, I can, if I didn't attach it this time, I'll send it again. The president of Smith Charities addressed just that question, which is that, um, first of all, uh, the building fits our use perfectly, but it probably wouldn't fit a lot of other uses perfectly. It's got the, the whole first floor, the middle, you know, it's it's like a square surrounded by an, a, a rear office and then front tellers. And the, the square in the middle is a vault. So like it it's it's a beautiful historic landmark, but it's not really, it functions great for us, but it, um, uh, Dave Murphy, the president, talked about how um, I think they might have like had it appraised, and it it doesn't. Uh, this was this was a couple of years back. I'd have to go look at his letter, but but his assessment when they looked into the same issue was that first of all, uh, it fits our perfect pur purpose perfectly, and it maintains the whole historic mission. Uh, uh, but it wouldn't fit other uses as well, so it might not sell for very much. Plus, we'd have to buy something else, and. Um, we, you know, there's, there's no mortgage on this. We don't pay rent. And even though 15,000, you know, if little by little you're upgrading the interior, you know, and you're not paying rent somewhere else um, and you're not purchasing a new building, um, it's actually way more cost-effective for us to stay put than to try to move somewhere um, at least. And I'll, I'll send you the letter from uh, Dave Murphy about that very issue. Um, they they did look into it a couple of years ago, years ago, and it was determined that it would be way more costly for us to move uh, than to stay where we are. And I think it's also like I mean, if you if you want to keep the historical integrity of you know whatever history there is in the downtown, I I think it's nice to keep it 
the way it is. And the other thing is, because we've gotten both uh, CPA funding and Mass Historic Preservation grants, um, there's preservation restrictions on this property. So I don't know, like, even if you were to resell it, could they like remove the bank vault in the middle? I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, you know, I, what's nice about us being there is that it keeps the whole historic integrity of the building and, you know, the, the, you know, the history of the nonprofit and it would be way more costly to move. So, I, I, but I'll send you that letter and that, can probably answer it better than I have. Great, thank you, Carol. Any other questions for Carol? Also, knowing Northampton rents, I don't think we could rent anywhere for cheaper than 15,000 over three years. So 15,000 isn't too bad if you're you know, looking at upgrading something that you already own. Well, thank you for addressing that. <laughs> Uh, once again, any other any other questions? Carol, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank and you again, very much. Uh, two weeks from now will be the public uh, comment. Um, so, without further questions from Carol, we are done hearing from our three applications. In the agenda was welcome our new member, uh, and I think we've. We sort of did that with welcoming Jeff. And Jeff, for you to know, we're at a uh, a little, uh, I want to say easier cycle here with only three applicants. Um, in two weeks, we have the public comment session and then we'll see how, how that goes and whether we'll begin our deliberations at that time. And as you know, Jeff, uh, we are the recommending body to city council, city council that approves or does not approve what what our recommendations are. But thank you for filling in for uh, Julia and um, we appreciate your, your time. Uh, moving on, and Sarah sent this out, which was the yearly request from the Community Preservation Coalition uh, for our dues. Uh, for those of you that are relatively new, we've gone on and on about this in the past, but essentially we owe, or they are requesting $4,350. Uh, a number of years ago, we balked at paying it and there were some awkward moments there. At least I felt awkward about it. Um, and we ended up paying, we ended up coming back and paying it. Uh, the I think Sarah does such a wonderful job on our end in handling all of these issues. I think for a lot of towns do not have a staff member and really rely on the coalition a lot more than, than Northampton does. You know, we're blessed with such supportive and hardworking people at the, at the city level, mainly Sarah. Um, other towns don't have that, use the coalition more. But in any event, there is a, we need to have a motion of uh, whether to pay this 4,350, which is more or less what we pay every year. Um, so before someone makes a motion, is there a discussion about this? Yeah, Brian, could you elaborate a little bit more on that decision in the past to not pay it and then, then, then a subsequent decision to pay it? And was it based on that same logic you just suggested that we don't need their services or was it on based on something else or did they raise the dues? It seems like an extraordinary amount of money to me, and I, and I, I can't imagine what we would get out of it. Maybe some one of you can explain. Sarah, can you help us out with this? Yeah, so just to quickly summarize the discussion in the past, it was, you know, the committee basically said at that point, Jonah, the same thing that, that you just did, that this is a lot of money. This could be spent on projects. We're not really sure what benefit we're seeing from the coalition you know we we have our own staff person we don't we don't really benefit from new communities adopting the community preservation act uh so we we communicated all of those concerns to the community preservation coalition uh they did actually come to a meeting we were still meeting in person at that time um and gave an overview of their activities and including um, you know keeping on top of any potential threats to the enabling legislation as it stands 
uh, helping new communities, answering questions, working with the Department of Revenue on their database. Um, and also, I think, pretty notably lobbying really heavy for this uh, additional state surplus distribution. So we, we get, uh, as a community that has the maximum tax surcharge, um, three distributions from the Department of Revenue. Uh, and then some years, you know, it's been pretty much every year for the past, I think, five or six, we get an additional distribution from the state budget surplus. And that is, that is largely in part to the Community Preservation Coalition's lobbying efforts. Uh, and that, that does far exceed the four, $4,350 that they're invoicing us for. And I don't know if anybody else who was on the committee at that time wants to add to that. Sure, I'll take a whack at it. <laughs> Since that's what I do every year, um, I, I think, Jonah, that uh, you you express my concerns pretty well, um, which is, you know, I'm 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 a big fan of giving uh, of recommending grants. I'm not a huge fan of recommending overhead. Um, it was an easier argument to make the first time this came around when I was on the when I was on the committee because. We were in a situation where we were literally scrambling for dollars. Um, unlike the last couple of rounds where we've had more money than than applicants, uh, we were oversubscribed at one point by a factor of like three or four to one. Um, and it seemed to me that, um, uh, you know, any any money that we could keep locally was was worth doing. Um, I, I have always and this is my own personal bias. I've always questioned the efficacy of 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 uh, lobbying on on this type of issue, um, but I, I won't I won't. And and it's and it it it's one thing to say uh, more money is coming to us. It's another thing to say it's coming to us directly because of the op of the operations of of a particular entity. Um, I think it's easy for them to take credit for it, but I'm not, I've never been, and I'm not, I'm not saying they don't do good work, but I'm just saying, you know, would it have happened with or without them? Um, but it's an argument I make every time and it's an argument I lose every time. And uh, um, uh, at, at this point, I'm sort of, <laughs> I'm running out of momentum on it, but I'm not going to support it. I'll abstain. So thanks. Was that helpful, Jonah? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was around too, Jonah, and my my basic take at the time was um, they were invisible. They were they were missing in action, and then we get this invoice, and we're like, um, "So exactly what are we getting here?" And so it was a chance to to call them on the carpet, and they did show up in person, and we did get a. You know, I got a better understanding, and ever since then, I get regular emails about we're doing this, we're doing that. Um, so the last couple of funding cycles that have gone rather well, um, I, I kind of agree. I don't know if they if they basically try to take credit for it. I don't know if it's them or that's just happening. Um, it, it's hard to say, but. Um, I think there was a time when the future funding <clears throat> for for the this type of uh, committee was very much in doubt, <clears throat> and it seems to be more stable. Knock on wood, we'll see. But <clears throat> it seems to be more predictable now, and we seem to be doing really well the last couple of cycles. And I would like to think that they had something to do with that, but we'll see. <laughs> Uh, Jen, any thoughts that you want to share? No, it, the amount of it surprised me. Um, it, I would like to get on their newsletter so that I can learn a little bit more about what they do. Because similarly, I mean, I work in, um, I work for CISA, which is community involved in sustaining agriculture. I know that, like, we are part of a statewide agricultural policy group that is really effective on the state level. So I believe that can be possible, but I just don't know. But I'm not, I don't feel strongly enough to 
object to this fee this year, I guess. Um, but I hear what everyone's saying. I, I like the idea that we would be supporting smaller communities to access resources. That feels like a nice thing to do as a, as a place with more wealth. But. I think in my opinion, that's the main reason to support it is I think if, if everybody had their own staff people, maybe staff person maybe would be less than necessary. Sarah, how does the, the are the fees derived? I mean, how, what, why do we pay 4,300? How does that work, do you know? I believe it is based on a formula derived from local revenue. Um, so we're, we're in the top tier of the funding structure, except for the, the largest communities. Like I think Boston and Worcester have a, a an even larger allocation. Let me see if I can find it quick. And, and I think I ask this every year, but as more and more communities continue to come into adopting uh, uh, community Pres preservation acts for their own towns, the amount of revenue continues to go up to the coalition. Is that right? So uh, do they do more now? Because I mean, Boston only came in not that long ago, right? Yeah, Boston is a recent adopter. So we're, we used to be, I believe, closer to the top of the, um, the due structure. So local CPA revenue up to two, uh, two and a quarter is 43.50. So we might be exceeding that at some point. But, you know, so Boston is paying $20,000 in coalition dues. Great, thank you for that. Um, any other questions for Sarah about this? Um, forgive me for talking so much, but I'll ask one more. Sarah, I know I get these, I don't, it's maybe not weekly, but every few weeks an email from the coalition saying one thing or another. Do, do all of us get that as, as uh, CPC members? I believe so. They do have an updated uh, email list. So, you okay, should. can we make sure that everyone gets that? Because Jen, you were saying maybe you don't. Is that? I get a lot of newsletters, so it's possible <laughs> that I just haven't found it, but I have not. Oh, noticed wait, it. what? It, it does get hit by spam filters as well. So, I do check spam, but I am on too many newsletters for it, a work lot. and personal. <laughs> so, yeah. No. Anyways, it doesn't sound familiar to me either for whatever it's worth. So, but similarly, I, it, it could be there, um, but I don't recall ever seeing it. Uh, Jana, any other comments that you'd like to contribute to this? Um, no, I think I agree with um, what other folks have said, particularly what Jen said about, you know, us contributing to to help other communities in the state and it would be nice to understand a little bit better what they're doing. Um, Jeff, uh, new Jeff, new Jeff and old Jeff. New Jeff, any questions that you have or comments you'd like to make? No, I think I'm all set, thank you. Um, if it's okay, then Brian, if everybody's had a chance, I'd like to take another bite at the apple because something's gotten said that I, I, I feel I, I would like to address. Um, so of the seven of the nine members here, I'm one of the two that's elected. And so that means that the taxpayers of Northampton are my uh, technically my constituents. And if I was to go into a room full of my constituents and ask them to support me for reelection, and say to them, oh, and by the way, one of the things that I do is support spending some of your money so that uh, for work that's going to be done in another community, I don't think it's going to be well received. Uh, so I, while I think it's nice that the smaller communities get helped out, um, that direct line between us and them, I'm not sure that that's, I'm not sure that there's a steward of Northampton's tax money, that that's the position I want to go at. So I'm just going to raise that.
thank you, Chris. You always do such a good job in, uh, in speaking how you feel when it comes to this issue and every issue. Anybody else on this, uh, Jen? Yeah, I would just say like my only, I hear, ex I hear exactly what you're saying, Chris, and don't entirely disagree. I think I would just say having worked in conservation specifically, like from a conservation perspective, like you can't just think within a city about conservation and have any meaningful impact. Like it is a regional and statewide effort. And so like if we in Northampton preserve 27% of our land and nobody else does and has the tools and resources to do so, that's gonna have like the impact on like species, climate change, et cetera, is gonna be much smaller. So, and I think that's probably the case for some of the other types of things that we fund, maybe a little less directly, but just that scale feels important kind of in connecting the work that we're doing um, in a meaningful way. Thank you, Jen. That was really helpful for me to hear that. Hey, Brian, could you um, speak more about what you said before about uh, an ever increasing number of communities, particularly small communities, adopting CPA uh, practices? And, um, and has that been ongoing since it was created? Uh, and, and how do how do you guys know, maybe Sarah knows the answer to this, but um, like a community that has no staffing support, uh, how are these things typically handled? Um, yeah, does any judge just a, a sense of it? Because I, I have I, I, I have no no experience with that. Sarah, you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, a committee that would have no staff at all would really be a, you know, a very small community with probably not a 3% rate, maybe like a half a percent or 1% that's just raising a, a very small amount of money and either saving that up for future projects or awarding funds to some smaller projects or municipal projects. Um, you know, there, certainly every CPA city has someone like me who, who's writing contracts, who's, you know, discussing possibilities with applicants and doing the day-to-day -day work. I don't know if that, that helps to address that piece of it. Um, and as far as additional communities adopting the CPA, I mean, there, you know, ever since the enabling legislation um, was passed at the state level, there has been a steady stream of, of adopters um, at the municipal level. It's, there's been some fairly large communities recently who have adopted the CPA and because of the funding structure coming from registry of deeds fees, you know, not just for those communities who have adopted the CPA, but statewide there it's, it can be basically the same pot of money being allocated to more, more and more communities, you know, at, as there's more registry of deeds fees that, that can fluctuate. Um, but, you know, if, if every community adopted the CPA, that pot of money would certainly be a lot smaller. Is that helpful, Joe? Great. Jen? Yeah, just a question. Um, and I sh I'm sorry, when you sent this, I should have like researched a little bit more to understand this, but is, is our membership in this coalition mandatory? Like what would happen if we didn't pay our dues and be a member? Uh, we, we would receive a, immediate follow-up <laughs> was our experience last time. Uh, but it's in no way mandatory. I mean, this is a this is completely voluntary. Um if, I would imagine if we if the if Northampton declined to participate, then we would expect a similar response this time that you know we those newsletters that are going out probably would would cease to be received by people and we wouldn't be able to ask the coalition questions. Um, although I there's not a, a lot of that going on currently. I'd be interested to know how many of the communities that have CPA are members. That I, they told us last time and it was a very high percentage. Uh, but, I, but I don't see that on their website. 
Thank you. That's just, it's really helpful to me to know. It did feel a little just out of the blue, like getting a doctor's bill that you thought you'd paid the copay already or whatever. So it is helpful to know a little bit more of the background of the structure of it. The, you know, my, my memory of the last time, Jen, when we, when we didn't, uh, when we made the decision not to pay is, again, the executive director, uh, came and visited us as a meeting at, at a meeting and uh and explained in some detail you know his his uh articulate voicing of the necessity of the of the coalition not you know for other towns as as well as for us and i don't know it it, it made for some awkward i thought some awkward moments i'm laughing anxiously about remembering that and part of me is like oh please don't have Stuart come and visit us again. I don't want. I don't want to be disciplined again. Oh, uh, but, I'll just uh, say it would be interesting for me for all of us to sort of think about. Like to me, I would love for them to be a little bit more um, visible to me. And like one thing, like I'm really glad that they're a resource for Sarah, though Sarah is a resource in and of herself, a wonderful resource to us, but it would be kind of great to like, feel a little bit more connected to other people in this role in other towns. Like it just got my gears turning of like, what are some things we wish they did? And maybe we could offer that as feedback at some point, um, if that would make it feel more valuable or meaningful for us to be participating in these dues. So. That was just one idea, but it's something I'll think about and I'd encourage folks to, if there are things we wish that they were doing. Yeah, when they came out, uh, when this was brought up last time, they really stressed the um, defense of the CPA that sort of goes on behind closed doors that, you know, there's legislation being filed would seem like pretty extensively that could undermine the CPA in various ways. Not not direct um, or not always directly um, changes being made to the CPA enabling legislation, but other types of legislation that, that could potentially undermine the CPA and how much time that takes and, and the success that they've been able to have, have doing that and building relationships and, and Beacon Hill. And I think at any time we could ask Stuart Sagan or one of his staff people to uh, visit us either virtually or if we have to go back in person in person to to answer some of these questions as they're present and to uh, tell us in more detail. So I think if we if we want that, let's tell Sarah to try to make that happen and she can certainly go ahead and do that. So people people want another visit from Stuart or his designee, let's let's do that. The, the only thing I, I would say that Sarah misspoke is when she said, oh, every you know, all the larger communities have have a have a Sarah LaValley. And I and I'm and I'm not quite sure that's that's true. They may have that position. But I think again, we are so fortunate in Northampton to have Sarah and to have that whole office of sustainability and planning uh, doing so much work for us. And I guess I'm not convinced that other municipalities, even larger ones, do the job that 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 uh, that Sarah and her co-workers do. So thank you, Sarah, as always, for that work. Um, any other comments about this? I just have one question. Um, just trying to understand this coalition. Um, so is this something that the city was automatically enrolled in once they decided to participate in the CPA? Is there a process in which the commission at some point decided that it was something they wanted to support or just how did that kind of happen? Are people automatically enrolled or? It's, yeah, I mean, it's not as formal as that. Um, so every community that has adopted the Community Preservation Act, um, I, I guess is a, a quote unquote member of the coalition, the way that they see it. Um, so the, the coalition itself was founded by Trust for Public Land, Citizens Housing and Planning Association, Mass Affordable Housing Alliance, Mass Audubon and Preservation Massachusetts um, back in 2007. And those are all members of the steering committee, but it's, it's not a membership organization. They're basically just um, 
advocating on behalf of CPA issues and CPA communities. Is that helpful, Jeff? Yeah, I'm just curious because it sounds like, you know, um, historically we kind of just received a, a, an ask for dues of an organization that we weren't necessarily affiliating ourselves with other than the fact that they were saying that they were representing um, this entity. And if there's questions about dues, I'm just wondering, you know, just the, the background context of it and how it how it kind of came to be and if it was something that we elected to participate in or if it was something that, you know, was automatic based on the program, um, just for my own understanding. Any further comments on that, sir? Yeah, I mean, it's not like, um, like Jeff, I'm sure you're familiar with the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions. It's not an organization like that where, you yeah. know, where payment of dues then, um, uh, then provides additional resources for members like guidebooks and, you know, discounted rates at conferences and those types of things. It, it's not that. This is just, you know, we, we've been doing important work on your behalf, CPA community. Yep. You know, this is what we're going to be charging you. So every, every community that's adopted the CPA. Thank yeah, you. it's just an interesting approach <laughs> on their behalf. Um, you know, and I think, you know, people's points about supporting smaller communities is important. Um, you know, especially Jen's comment about, you know, conservation and those efforts. But also I think something you said, Sarah, too, that kind of strengthens, you know, at least at this point, paying the dues would be the fact that, um, you know, there is that fourth round of funding that they, you know, help lobby for with the surplus, which far exceeds the, the dues that we're paying. So, you know, if we pay a little bit in and get exponentially more out, um, it may be worth it, but something that sounds like everyone's interested in learning more about um, moving forward. Is it worth our while, uh, whether it's this round or in the fall to ask Stuart to come back for uh, 20 minutes or half hour to speak to the role of the, of the coalition? Would people be interested in that? I think having him show up on Zoom once a year seems like a no-brainer to explain to us what they've been doing. So, yes, that's a, everybody else, thumbs up. Jan, I can't see your thumb. Yep. Yes. Okay, Sarah, could you try to facilitate that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it may, it may not happen till the fall, but that would, that would be okay. Uh, and uh, with enough notice I, I imagine Stuart or again one of his staff people could could make that happen any other questions about this for Sarah or comments so we need a motion uh, to be made regarding the uh, dues the the payment of uh, four thousand three hundred fifty dollars to the community preservation coalition Someone make a motion. Uh, I'll make the motion to uh, to vote. Uh, thank you, Jonah. Second. A second. Jen. Any further discussion? Sarah. Uh, and just to be clear, Jonah, the the motion was to pay the the dues. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so roll call vote on that, Jana. Yes. Jeff Jones? Yes. Chris? Dane. Jeff Dawson? Yes. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, for helping us figure that out. We will all look forward to, oh, is that the right words, um, to it? to one of the staff people coming in and uh, and presenting. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, particularly if we paid our dues, it will make it a little, <laughs> a little easier. Uh, let's see, last on the agenda, as always, any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? Anybody got anything else? So when we meet again in two weeks, it will be time for, um, 
the public to comment on these three proposals in front of us. In the past, given the number of proposals that we've had, we've tended to defer our voting until the following meeting because we wanna do it all at once. We'll see how it goes, right? I mean, if there's not that much public speaking out on these three issues, if it goes, if it goes relatively quickly, hopefully we'll see a lot of people, but if we don't, or even if we do, we'll just make that decision at the meeting whether to continue and do our deliberations. And again, I think in the past, and I know it's been helpful for me, that we do all the deliberations in one meeting, but we don't start them and we stop and we come back. And then I, for one, can't remember a thing about what we did before. So it's just, it's not a great use, I think, of our time. So we either get it all done or we'll defer to next meeting, but we can, we can figure that one out. Um, so in lieu of that, if there's a motion to adjourn uh, and a second, yes, somebody, and yes, somebody. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second, and we are all good to go. We'll see you in two weeks.